This is February 4th. Uh, this is Senate Government Operations Committee. And um, I will, for those of you who aren't normally with us, I will tell you kind of what our rules are. We have a few, not very many rules, but we try to have the same kind of rules that we would have if we were in the room um, in, a, in the state house. And that means that um, the committee members, the chair is in charge, the committee members and staff our, our attorneys are the um, primary people in the in the room. The witnesses will be called on, and at so, depending on what the issue is, we sometimes just have a general roundtable discussion where we invite people to join. But um, in many cases, it's more formal than that, and we do not use chat. In our opinion, chat is like a side conversation going on in the committee room. And if we were in the committee room, we wouldn't allow those conversations. We would ask people to leave and go have their conversation in the hallway. So we don't use chat except um, Gail might use it for um, posting links or um, uh, information about uh, documents or sites that are um, given by people and then she will also put those on the um, document record for the next day when we um, come back. Does that make sense everybody? Okay, all right. So with that, um, we are today looking at um, the issue of, <coughs> excuse me, public records um, uh, by, around um, arrests of juveniles. And um, I don't know if everybody got it. There was a, um, a Rutland Herald, uh, what, it was Rutland Herald, right? Brian, Senator Collimore. Okay. Yes. And editorial in there today about this. And um, I read it. I don't know if anybody else had a chance to read it but um, I'm sure we'll hear the same testimony today, um, the same position on that. So um, I think I'm looking to see, I think what we'll do is um, start with, Tucker has a, I believe a, um, a draft um, for us and we'll start with him walking through that for us so that we can see where we are and what we're dealing with. And then we'll take testimony on that and general. Okay. All right, so Tucker, do you wanna? Absolutely, good afternoon for the record, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, Gail, do I have screen sharing authority? Do I have the wand? <laughs> I've got it, all right. So hopefully you can all see the bill on your screen. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the proposed draft language here, um, give some brief explanation of some of the clauses that are included and what they mean for a Public Records Act exemption and how the process plays out. And then I will show you uh, some similar exemptions in the Public Records Act and I'll explain the conundrum of 1 VSA section 317 sub E and section two of this bill. So uh, to begin, section one contains uh, a new exemption within the law enforcement exemptions contained in 1 VSA section 317 C subdivision five. As you recall, the issue with this subdivision in the context of juvenile records is that subdivision 5B states that notwithstanding the law enforcement exemptions, records reflecting the initial arrest of a person, including any ticket, citation, or complaint issued for a traffic violation, and records reflecting the charge of a person shall be public. And this subdivision requires that a public agency that holds these records relating to the initial arrest of a person or the charge of a person must release those records under the procedures of the Public Records Act. 
this had some tension with specific protections around law enforcement and court records relating to a person who is under the jurisdiction of the family court in a juvenile or juvenile diversion proceeding. This language would clarify this subdivision 5B and state that a public agency shall not release any information within a record that reflects the initial arrest or charge of a juvenile. And I'll highlight that term because I'm not sure based on the policy choices of the committee, whether that's the right term here, that would reveal the identity of the juvenile. The policy choices that you made during your last meeting you wanted to allow the public agency, rather require the public agency, to withhold identifying information contained within the record. There are two things to keep in mind here. First, this is mandatory language. It states that the public agency shall not release any information that would reveal the identity of the juvenile. That means that the public agency is not going to be performing a balancing test. They are required to withhold this information. Under no circumstances can they release it. Second, this is a moving target. The exemption applies to any information within a record that would reveal the identity of a juvenile. And the thing to keep in mind about this type of exemption is that it triggers two types of responses that cover a broad array of information within a record. The first is called a mosaic response. The public agency, when they're applying an exemption like this, has to take into consideration the universe of information that would allow the public to identify the juvenile. So depending on the context of the record and the way that the request is submitted, the public agency is going to have to withhold any information that the public agency believes or knows would identify the individual juvenile. Senator Collimore brought this up last time when he talked about particularly small Vermont municipalities where an offender in this case may be well known based on really any information contained within the record that would show where they live, what their name is, potentially what the offense was, the public agency is going to have to withhold all information that would lead to an identification of the juvenile. That's Madam the mosaic response. Can I ask oh. a clarifying question while we're on different yep. directions? Yeah. So just to clarify, we only have jurisdiction over public agencies. It doesn't make sense to try and speak about an individual within a public agency or a private entity that was on the scene, like a towing company or anything like that. This is the only place that we're going to have this jurisdiction regardless. And is there, I'm just wondering, so, you know, when we say public agency, does that cover any individual who works in the public agency? And we just know we don't have private jurisdiction over anyone else on the scene. We'll jump off from the latter part of your question there. That is the case. This applies to public agencies, which in this case means uh, executive branch agencies and municipalities um, and their officers. So when you apply, and we talked last time about um, these express mandatory exemptions where you say you shall not release any information or the clause that is typically used is shall keep confidential you're applying a duty of confidentiality to the public agency that has to be carried out by its officers. Um, and last time we talked a little bit about, are there any penalties associated with the unauthorized release of this information? And the answer is broadly that it depends on the type of information being released, whether the statute that mandates confidentiality has its own specific um, penalties for release of the information, whether there's any overlap with federal law. So for example, uh, patient privacy uh, and information um, and whether there is any potentially negligent act that led to the release of the information um, by a public officer. 
So we discussed the mosaic response. The one other type of response that I wanna highlight for you so that you are aware of the full context of this type of exemption is what's known as a GLOMAR response. And GLOMAR responses are the least favored nation of Public Records Act responses. Would you uh, spell that for me? G-L-O-M-A-R. Hopefully oh. I spelled that correctly. Glomar response is famously that the public agency can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the record. And these responses come up specifically and are triggered by types of requests. I'll give you an example. We have said here that the public agency shall not release any information within a record that would reveal the identity of the juvenile. If the requester says, I would like any record uh, relating to the arrest of John Smith in Cavendish. John Smith is a juvenile. The public agency cannot confirm that the record exists because they would necessarily be identifying the juvenile. Right now, mm -hmm. if the requester had submitted a request and said, I want um, all arrests related to X subject for the last week, and it happened to include John Smith, juvenile in Cavendish, they could release a record with certain information redacted, but not when the request specifically identifies the juvenile that is the subject of the record. Section two, this is optional. Again, another policy choice that has to be made by the committee, but I wanted to flag it for your attention. Uh, two or three years ago, if memory serves right, the Public Records Act was amended in 1 VSA section 317 to uh, add a requirement that Public Records Act exemptions be repealed five years after enactment or substantive amendment. Now, of course, future assemblies are not bound by this sort of statute. So if a rec Public Records Act exemption passes without a repeal section, expressly repealing it, uh, it's not going to repeal on its own. So the choice has to be made every time uh, whether an exemption is going to be subject to review for repeal in five years or whether you're going to say this exemption should continue in perpetuity we're not gonna review it in five years. And uh, for your reference, there's a list put together by the Office of Legislative Council of all of the exemptions that will be subject to review um, starting in 2024 will be the first year of review. And it's available on the General Assembly's website. Section three deals with custody of the records at the time that a proceeding starts um, in the court. It goes to the section that deals with um, court and law enforcement records that relate to a proceeding of a juvenile under the jurisdiction of the court. And it adds new language here that states that when a person is subject to the jurisdiction of the court pursuant to this chapter, the court shall become the sole records custodian, important clause coming up, for purposes of responding to any request for court or law enforcement records concerning the person. So what does this do? This states that at the point that a proceeding actually starts and the Title 33 confidentiality provisions are triggered, the court becomes the only agency in the state that may respond to a request for law enforcement or court records relating to the juveniles proceeding. Um, it further states here that the public agency shall direct any request for the records to the courts for response. So if any public agency in the state receives a request for these sorts of records and the proceedings have begun, the public agency will direct the requester to the courts for a response. Uh, the reason that we have this clause here for purposes of responding to any request is that custodians have more duties than just responding. So um, custodianship of these records for purposes of records management and preservation 
are still going to stay with the public agencies that are performing the initial arrest or charge. It's only the response duty of the custodian that is passing to the courts at the time the proceeding starts. The effective date here uh, is listed as July 1st, 2021. That is the content of the bill. Um, I covered it, but I wanted to bring it up and show you in case you had any curiosity of some of the PRA existing language that may be relevant here. If we look at the C5 law enforcement exemptions, um, there is a similar exemption um, in application and operation in subdivision 5D. And um, we talked about this last year with some of the Public Records Act work that you were doing at the beginning of the session. Um, this uh, requires that a public agency shall not reveal information that could be used to facilitate the commission of the crime. And then here's the important part, or shall not reveal the identity of a private individual who is a misdue or victim of a crime. There's a follow-up clause, unless withholding the identity or information would conceal government wrongdoing. But this type of uh, identity protective moving target exemption exists in statute already protecting the identities of witnesses to or victims of crimes. You may have heard testimony in the past about how this is applied differently depending on public agencies. I wanted to highlight it for you to ref uh, refresh your recollection of some of the discussions last year about the um, GLOMAR responses and the mosaic responses. And then I wanted to bring up the 1BSA 317E language in E2 here that legislation that enacts, reenacts, or substantively amends an exemption shall explicitly provide for its repeal on July 1st of the fifth year after the effective date of the exemption. So that's that section two piece that we covered. That is all I have for you, unless you have uh, questions after the walkthrough. Committee, does any, uh, Senator Polina, and then Senator Colomar. That's just a clarifying question. I think I know the answer to it, but you talked Tucker about that this comes into play after the proceedings begin. You mentioned that phrase a couple of times. I'm presuming that the proceedings, when do the proceedings begin? In other words, if I commit a crime and I'm arrested on Monday night, does the, the proceedings begin right then and there or some later time? So um, I may have been inartful in that description. Uh, it's triggered, uh, that provision is triggered when the person comes under jurisdiction of the court. And that is the term that is used all through the chapter. The protections apply when a person is under jurisdiction of the court. Um, that is when the uh, state's attorney has referred the case for juvenile proceedings rather than going to uh, criminal court. Which so that, I would be, is that would be at the very beginning of all this. In other words, a crime is committed or I'm arrested and it starts right then and there. So the timeline, you're going to have to take some testimony okay. about this from the experts in the area, but the timeline varies considerably depending on the type of offense in the case in question. And for legislative purposes from your legislative council, what you're building here, two temporal phases. First, public agency either arrests formally charges, right? They have a record that is subject to the Public Records Act. They are a custodian that can respond. Then you have this hard temporal line. As soon as it comes, the person is under the jurisdiction of the court. The courts become the custodian. And so okay. correct me if I'm wrong here, but I thought that our intent was, and I thought that the way this reads, I mean, that's the way it is now, but I thought our intent was to say that the arrest record, the Im immediately it is 
um, exempt from public records requests. That's not when it becomes under the jurisdiction of the court. That's the way it is now. And that's the problem. So there are two separate pieces. So the identifying information in the record right. is exempt, period. That's section one. It establishes the exemption. The other piece that you're tackling here is who is responsible for responding oh. to the request. And the answer okay. depends on the phase. And the reason that that uh, temporal line was chosen is that there was testimony at the last meeting that not all cases may actually be referred to court. And if the case isn't referred to court and we state that custodianship of all of these records belongs solely to the courts, then what happens to access to the record? Who is responsible for these, those particular subsets of records? So the, there is a record and it might be subject to public records request, but all it could say was there was a fatal accident on Route 30 at 2.30 in the morning and it couldn't, a, an unidentified juvenile was involved. Or it may be the actual, whatever the actual arrest record is with identifying information right. redacted. And again, that's going to change depending on the context, you know, a more right. populous municipality with more routine offense, you may only be redacting the name, address and other identifying information related to the individual. Um, in other cases, you may have to redact more to protect the identity of the person. Okay, yeah, got it. Senator Collimore, did you have a question? I have actually three or four, but I'll start with this one. So, Tucker, if this law was in effect, and I don't remember what day it was, but there was a situation at the University Mall this past week where there was the shooting. And the man, I believe, was 18, might end up in juvenile court, might not if uh, the state's attorney decides to file charges. How would we be addressing public safety in kind of that same case where the police might be actually hoping the public could help find the shooter if we were withholding the information? I'm also remembering a situation at Fairhaven High School, oh gosh, it was three or four years ago where there was a situation where uh, uh, one of the uh, I don't know if it was a student at the time or a former student who was going to shoot up the school. But the identity of that person, I believe, was, was uh, released immediately in hopes of finding the person so that the public safety issue could be addressed. Am I, am I correct by saying if this was in effect, police would not have been able to uh, identify any sort of identifying characteristics of those, of those people? So I would question whether in either of those cases, the public agency was releasing information contained in a initial arrest record or a charge record, right? This is saying that in the case that you have an initial arrest record or a charge record, you're not gonna release identifying information. I am wondering whether in both of those cases, if those records don't exist yet and the uh, law enforcement agency is carrying out a duty related to public safety by releasing the name you know this is this particular exemption you're dealing with here is dealing with a very um it's dealing with a specific carve out in a general law enforcement exemption and saying that yes you have these more general law enforcement exemptions to the public records act but in the case of arrest records and records relating to the charge of a person, you have to release those. And we're further saying, if you're going to release those particular records and it relates to a juvenile, you have to remove identifying information. Okay. Here's another question. And I still have a couple others, but I'll wait until if anybody else wants to weigh in. So let's say that there, there was a court proceeding and it was in juvenile court and um, what about the issue of DMV and uh, fish and wildlife situations where the, uh, one of the public agencies might have wanted to suspend a license or a, a, you know, a fishing or hunting license or a driving license, but they wouldn't be able to access those records because they'd be confidential? Uh, 
Um, I think they can't suspend it until there's actually a charge, not on arrest. If there's an arrest, say somebody is charged with a, a DUI and they want to suspend their license, it doesn't it doesn't take effect. That doesn't take effect until there's an arraignment in court. So at that time, there, the arrest record doesn't um, get rid of the driver's license or the hunting license. No, I realize that, Madam Chair. But what I'm saying is, if if this bill didn't list all the exemptions, the outcome of the hearing, there's already been a hearing, and and a charge has been issued, and we have a decision but the decision is, is confidential. How would DMV and the fish and wildlife folks know about the decision that's already been made in court? Um, I, I, if it goes to juvenile court, yeah. um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, this is my understanding from Judiciary Committee that if it goes to juvenile court, the juvenile court can impose those sanctions that they could say you have to go to diversion, you lose your license for this long of a time, you can't, you lose your hunting license. They're going to set the parameters, but it's still a confidential record. But they, it isn't as if just because it goes to juvenile court, nothing happens to them. Okay. Senator Collimore, I'm going to balk at part of this and get a better answer for you moving forward about information sharing between public agencies. But uh, what Senator White just brought up is an excellent point that the, this is not going to control the court's disclosure or disposition of the records. And if the Judicial Bureau is going to pass along some sort of um, you know, consequence related to a driving license, driver's license driving permit, um, they can give that information to the DMV. There was... Um, Another question last time that I was prepared for about whether the DMV would still be disclosing certain types of driver reports that are related to these sort of offenses. And um, the Federal Drivers Privacy Protection Act and the Public Records Act do work together. So disclosures under the DPPA are discretionary. And uh, Vermont law, as far as discretionary release of that sort of data and information is concerned, does take Vermont's Public Records Act into consideration. So if this general exemption were put in the Public Records Act, it is my understanding that it would also carry over to the types of data and reports that the DMV is allowed to release under a discretionary release in the DPPA. And I can send you um, some citations about that. Okay. Um, I do have one other, but I'll I sure. certainly- No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. So I remember when I was in school and I'm talking about insurance companies now, we would get a break on rates if we had a certain average, grade point average and all that kind of stuff. And if we had a good driving record, I remember that. If the insurance companies have no access to the driving records, how would that affect uh, this whole landscape? In other words, the, the, the rates would be based on good driving records. They don't have any information on that. So how can insurance companies offer that service anymore? And I don't know whether uh, Mike Pichak or somebody from uh, DFR might want to weigh in on that. Those are some of the questions that I thought about over the last couple of days. Yeah, I, I'm not... We'll, we'll hear from them on that. I'm not sure how they would do the good driver benefit. Um, if, if they did suspend the license, um, if the juvenile court did suspend the license, then they could um, require an SR-22 in order to get that license back. I mean, that could be part of the, the deal, SR but- What's an huh? SR-22? Oh, I'm sorry, an SR-22 is, it's a high risk um, insurance pool. It's for oh, people okay. who've had many accidents or DUIs or it's I always, knew, I always knew I didn't want to jump in that pool. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but I know it's called an SR-22. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. 
Any other questions of clarification for Tucker on this? All right, well, seeing no other questions of clarification, let's go then to, um, I'm going to, we have uh, two members of the, of the media with us. Did you, did any, speaking of media, did anybody read Bill Schubart's column the other day about social media and what on earth is social about what we call social media? <laughs> it was a really good article because there is nothing social about that. But anyway, so, and then we have um, Sheriff Anderson and Mike Sherling. Does any, first of all, let me ask, does anybody have a time constraint here that would um, require them to go earlier than later? If so, just let me know. Um, Madam Chair, I just need yes. to be off by 2.30. I thought that was the schedule for the, for the agenda. It, it, it probably is. Okay. <laughs> um, right. But, and um, so if we start getting closer to where people have to move and we aren't done yet, please speak up and um, we'll fit you in. So does the administration have a position on this at all? Are you, do you want to weigh in or are you kind of listening to see where we go? Um, and you're directing that to me? Yes, yes. Oh, um, I just, I mean, I wanted to thank you. I mean, first of all, for the record, Jay Pershing Johnson, Governor's Legal Counsel. I just wanted to thank the committee for the invitation. Um, I just wanted to make a short statement. Um, so it's sure. not really at this point weighing in on the bill. Okay. Um, and I know that some of the explanation that Tucker has given, you know, may give rise to, to, to questions. Um, but I, I just had a short, a couple of short observations generally. Do you want to give them now or do you want to wait? Um, I don't mind giving them now, but it's sure. really your pleasure. No, that's fine. Please do. Okay. Um, so first of all, I did want to acknowledge that I know that lawmakers are always trying to balance uh, competing and conflicting policy concerns, um, and that this task is particularly difficult when balancing concerns for confidentiality and the availability of public records. Um, you know, I, I just speaking on behalf of the governor, greater transparency, and, and I think most if elected officials, greater transparency of records is something that we've tried to reinforce across the governmental enterprise. Um, we understand that the principles of restorative justice guide our work in the areas of child and family services, law enforcement, pretrial and diversion services, and corrections. We believe our communities are safer when people, um, you know, especially juveniles get the services they need so that they don't repeat um, offenses. Um, that said, we also value the safety of our roads um, and our communities and transparency in government and access by the media and all Vermonters to government records. Um, I really, my observation is limited at this time to um, the VSP media policy that was originally worked out in 2017 and modified really just administratively in 2019, um, which I'm happy to share with the committee if they're interested. But at that time, the Commissioner of Public Safety um, considered applicable law and feedback from the media and spent a great time of, a great deal of time in discussions with members of the media on the policy. So that's been in place uh, for four years and we believe it reflects a reasonable compromise position um, which strikes the right balance of protections for juveniles at, involved in the justice system and the transparency, uh, I think, demanded by the media and all Vermonters. Um, it is limited in what is disclosed about uh, juveniles now, but it does currently allow the release of the name, the age, the gender, and the town of residence um, of juveniles in the instances when an involved party in a motor vehicle crash um, is identified based on their involvement in the crash. So operator, passenger, pedestrian, et cetera. Um, it would not address any, any legal status, whether it would be in family court or criminal court. Um, we would release the name, that information for individuals issued a Vermont civil violation complaint, I think which reflects the balancing between criminal complaints and civil complaints. Um, and then we also release information when the release as, and, and includes a photograph would aid in locating a missing person. Um, 
So really to Senator Collimore's point, as the, legis as the legislature and this committee in particular um, undertakes the process to achieve greater clarity and consistency in the law, which we do believe is important, um, we urge the committee to consider testimony from all agencies which might have a nexus with uh, juvenile records. So such as DMV for CDL licensing, um, Senator Collimer's point, DFR for automobile insurance purposes, possibly Secretary of State for licensing purposes, and, um, and maybe even agency of education on teacher licensing and daycare and school employee, uh, employee background checks. Um, I know some of this runs headlong into the, in the area of the Judiciary Committees, which are considering matters such as sealing and expungement of records um, and raising the age. Uh, you know, right now we're no a juvenile is no longer 18, a juvenile will be 19. Um, and for youthful offenders, that goes up to age 22. So it's really a matter of, you know, again, the, but the balancing of policy concerns. Um, so with respect to the bill, I guess if I'm reading it correctly, civil tickets and citations would still be subject to disclosure um, since they are not arrests or charges. Um, and on the subject of custody of records, a delinquent act does not currently include motor vehicle offenses committed by an individual who is at least 16 years of age. So they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the family court. It seems to me in the first part, their names couldn't be disclosed potentially um, if it's a criminal violation, but then th those records would remain, I guess with the law enforcement agency or DMV. Um, anyway, so I just, that may be an area where um, you might wanna consider greater clarity with respect to civil uh, violations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, we'll, we'll make sure we hear from all of these other people. Um, Senator Clarkson, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, Jay's point about youthful offenders, uh, uh, and I, are we including youthful offenders in this in additional to juveniles? Or are they, in com are they incorporated under the definition of juvenile? Quite honestly, sure. I am not completely sure how the juvenile offender laws work together with youthful offenders. Um, I believe there's a great deal of overlap, um, but I just, I could not tell you uh, with any certainty. You would need to some, speak to someone like um, maybe from the state's attorney's office um, who, could, who could give you more information about how that would overlap and what effect this might have. Or, I suspect, if we, or if we want to include, include them. Or if you want to expand it. Yeah, if yeah. that was your intent, um, yes. I suspect that David Scher can help us answer that question we get when we get there. And um, my understanding is that the juvenile is going to continue to be raised um, successfully, successively each year. And the youthful offender, well, I'll let him, I'll let him explain it. But um, so, uh, yeah, we'll have David explain that when when we get there. Right. Because I thought our long term hope was to raise it. And I didn't realize there was a differentiation and that we were because of what we know now about brain development, that we were slowly taking that up to age 25. I don't but I think thought 20... it was both youthful offenders. I thought that juvenile encompassed youthful offender. We will I do believe David youthful Church. offenders are often referred to family court. I can't tell you if it's the same process with respect to um, reference to family court as it is in a delinquency proceeding. Um, I just don't have the expertise to address that. So instead of prolonging the conversation right now, David, why don't you just jump in? Oh, is David with us? Oh, great. Yep. There he is. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. For the record, David Scher with the Attorney General's Office. Senator, as you were uh, referencing me, I was desperately looking for a, a piece that I wrote for myself about the various rather complex interplays uh, between juvenile jurisdiction and youthful offender. Let me try to give a very brief, without having found that, let me try to give a very brief overview uh, of what um, the basic structure is. Um, there are 
when we're talking about young people in um, who are subject to either a criminal charge or potentially a uh, delinquency petition or a youthful offender petition, both of which are essentially synonyms for a criminal charge. We're just using a different term for because they're going into a different court, not criminal court. We're, we're, the way that system works is a tiered system where um, different types of charges and different ages mean that a young person might be subject to different types of jurisdiction. So, um, you know, most offenses, if somebody is under the uh, eligibility age for juvenile court, which you're right, is shifting upward each year. Um, but if most offenses, if they're under that age, will be referred to uh, juvenile court. There are a set of crimes where, um, most, more, much more serious offenses, where somebody who is a juvenile might start out instead in adult court, uh, in regular criminal court. Uh, and again, I don't want to, the details get very involved because we're there's different age strata here that um, come into play. And I could give the committee a, a, a written uh, write-out of all those different things. I'm just trying to give an overview of the concepts here. Um, so, you know, young people, depending on the charge, may be, uh, are, are likely to be in juvenile court and more serious charges. They may be subject to adult jurisdiction. For somebody who uh, would otherwise be subject to adult jurisdiction uh, under a certain age, those individuals could be uh, subject to a youthful offender petition. Um, a youthful, once you get a youthful offender status, you are treated in almost all respects as though you are a subject to juvenile delinquency. The one difference is that if you are under youthful offender, you, you could be kicked back over to adult court if you're not fulfilling the terms of your um, either of your pretrial conditions or more likely of your post adjudication probation or whatever sort of conditions you're expected to fulfill. A juvenile cannot, somebody who's subject to regular juvenile delinquency jurisdiction cannot ever be kicked over to adult criminal court. Uh, and the youthful people who might uh, be able to access youthful offender are either people who are over the age of eligibility for juvenile delinquency court, but under 22. Uh, those are people who would otherwise be charged in uh, adult court, but a prosecutor may elect to instead charge them or make them subject to a youthful offender petition. Or uh, if you are under that juvenile age, um, which keeps shifting upward and it will continue shifting upward for the next year. Um, and you are and the law says that your initial jurisdiction was going to be in adult criminal court because you committed one of the more serious offenses. That's another uh, time when a prosecutor may elect to charge somebody as a youthful offender. I hope that was helpful. That's a, <clears throat> a bit of an overview of how that all plays together. If I heard attorney Anderson correctly, I, I believe he was saying that the term juvenile as it is in this subdivision is at present not fully defined. Um, and it would be something the committee would have to think about as to uh, how we, how you all um, define that to more precisely capture those various potential statuses. Thank you. Does that answer um, questions for people? I know it's a very complicated system. Well, it, um, it, it does make me think that in terms of this issue, public records, that we should be including juvenile offender, uh, uh, youthful offenders, because the, it, it's really a differentiation that's made at court about where they're gonna be charged. But in terms of its impact on their life, uh, in terms of what we're talking about here, it, it might make sense to include youthful offenders or, or define juvenile to, for the purposes of this of the Public Records Act to include youthful offenders. And though the, so um, under this law, the, uh, the way I read it is that if some, that the initial arrest record or whatever would not include defining information, identifying information.
but once if a if a juvenile was then um, went to criminal court instead of family court, that would that's immediately a public record in because criminal court they're they're public records. Am I right about that, David Tucker? So I would defer to Attorney Anderson on the intention behind the drafting. I will note that I'm not, my read of it right now, and again, I, I defer if I'm off on this, is that that point you just made is not fleshed out under this proposal fully, and that is probably <laughs> something we want to flesh out fully. It does seem like somebody who ends up in adult court, those normal public records rules it would make sense for them to apply, but I'll let uh, Attorney Anderson flesh that out a little more. Thank, thank you, David. It is not fleshed out in the exemption as it's drafted. I did highlight the term juvenile for you. Um, in earlier testimony, you've heard about the moving target of the term subject to the person subject to the jurisdiction of the court. Um, in reviewing those chapters in Title 33, I think that is somewhat intentional because the um, age or identifying factors for those people is going to completely change depending on which chapter the court process is um, taking place under, uh, which leads me to an error in the draft that I should probably note for you. There is a clause in there that says um, a person who is subject to the court pursuant to this chapter and uh, as the discussion was happening, I think that if you're going to move forward pursuant to this chapter would have to be struck and just keep the term a person who is subject to the jurisdiction of the court, because there are actually three chapters where the person is subject to the court. It's not just the general provisions chapter. So my apologies for that drafting error. Well, we all we all caught that and we were surprised. <laughs> um, committee. Uh, I know that this is uh, confusing, but let's um, hear from um, Mike. Thank you, Jay. Um, and David, are you going to stay with us? I can stay with you. Okay, thank you. Yes. I think so, before, uh, may I just, uh, Madam Chairman, just ask a clarifying question, David. Uh, David, would you um, think about this? And I mean, I don't know who. who how we come to, uh, um, how we conclude whether we should include youthful offenders. I mean, would it be your recommendation that we include youthful offenders given in our juvenile definition? I, I've just, I just in the last, since you all started talking about it is when I started reviewing the language. So I would love to have a little uh, more time and I'm happy to come yeah. back and, and give testimony on that question in particular. I can certainly see how it would be in line with policy to include people who are ultimately end up being subject to youthful offender. But again, some of those questions about if somebody doesn't end up subject to juvenile court, what happens there? I do think that needs to be um, clarified. Okay, thanks. Okay. So I guess I am confused about that, but um because if they're not subject to juvenile court or to family court, if they go to criminal court, their records are public, whether they're a juvenile or not. We're talking about- Yeah, but if they're arrested no, uh, and they're a little older, but they would be a youthful offender, but not a juvenile, that, then their record would be released. However, for the court's purpose until, I mean, well, Tucker may have a better answer than you were raising, sorry. I wanted to highlight what could become a crystal ball issue or a time machine issue here, which is that the term juvenile is being used right now. You're discussing what that means in the context of proceedings that are starting later than the arrest and the charge. So the question is, how do you narrow that down to a definable known term for the public agency that's responding to a request before it is referred to court and it comes under the court's custody. They're going right. to have to be able to figure that out. By the time that some of these youthful offender or diversionary processes are taking place, the public agency under this bill, you know, likely is already gonna to have to respond to a request. And by that point, 
under the bill again is not going to be the custodian who is responsible for responding. So you're going to have to find a term that is defined and known to the responding public agency at that time. I, th I think that we can do that, but I'd like to hear first from Mike and Lisa. Who wants to go first here? I have uh, six minutes, Madam Chair, oh, before I'm, I to go. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm glad you spoke up. That's so, quite all right. Um, uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety, uh, it, it, it strikes me listening to where you're at now, if I might offer a suggestion that rather than having this bifurcated delineation of what happens uh, with the initial contact and then what happens when it gets to particular courts, simply saying something like um, the records related uh, to juvenile cases are public only if and when they are charged as an adult in court or charged in criminal court or whatever that correct moniker is, that creates a single point at which there's a decision um, and then uh, it restricts access to the, the biographical information prior to that point. Right now it's operationalizing this with a couple thousand people, three or 4,000 people in the criminal justice system is gonna be quite complicated. Um, that said, I, I just wanted to also flag, um, uh, I think it was Senator Calmore mentioned, it, it might be helpful to have uh, a notwithstanding clause of some sort uh, indicating that publicity uh, can occur uh, at any age if there is an articulable risk to the public. So for example, the thing that happened uh, at the University Mall um, that suspect is, um, is wanted and not in custody right now. Um, we do need to maintain the ability to put that information out publicly. And in some cases that may be for uh, juvenile offenders as well that um, actually do pose an ongoing articulable risk to the public. And we do need to be able to release their information to ensure ongoing public safety. Uh, so it might be helpful to have a, a single line that says something like that. Yeah, Tucker, you got that right. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. There's a difference between protecting the public and just letting people know who it was that that did something. Yeah, it goes to the yeah. balance between uh, that everyone's been focused on for so many weeks now. Uh, yeah, I had other uh, observations, but I think that the, the first one that I made is sort of a synthesis of the various. Uh, notes that I was making as the conversation was unfolding. So that may be the quickest way or, or the most simplistic way to get to an end without having to weave your way through uh, lots of different minefields. Okay. okay, that's a good suggestion. So, um, uh, so my, uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I, we will, um, clearly, we won't finish this today. We will do this again next Thursday. Um, Thursday seems to be the day when we can get um, media people here. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Mike? I think I will defer to uh, our president, uh, Lisa Loomis. Uh, okay. I, I may be precluded from commenting further on it because I am covering this case involving the 16 year old who got the $220 fine for killing okay. two people. So I'm going to refer to Lisa, okay. I think, and go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Lisa? Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. And since the press association has not seen a copy of the bill or we're just seeing it for the first time, we would like to defer and hear from others, including Commissioner Pichak. I can say generally that the press association and its member newspapers across the state are stand strongly in favor of transparency as always. And we believe in the release of public records. Shutting off public records or reducing access to them goes against our constitution and against the longstanding um, statement of purpose for the Public Records Act, as well as the Attorney General's ruling and the state police policy. We stand ready. We also 
are having a full board issue next week to look at this and we will be happy to address this in greater once that's taking place. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, who else do we have here with us? Um, uh, Sheriff Anderson. Oh, and we have Carol Dawes. Oh, I think Carol, are you here for this or for the next one? The next one. Okay, great. <laughs> so Sheriff Anderson, do you have, would you like to weigh in on this? I think he just left. I know that he's been having huh. trouble with, and just for your information, he's been having trouble with his um, connection and also um, a number of his emails, if you are expecting emails from him, go into our trash for some reason. Um, I thought he was ignoring me. And in fact, his emails were in my trash bucket. Madam Chair, he just sent me a note that he had to leave. Okay. All right, well, I, I think that we will um, take continue this conversation um, and maybe um, if, might I'm wondering if it might also be um, good to have um, I think Bryn is the one that does deals with this to have to see if she can join us also for some of the more technical questions does that make sense sure okay, okay. all right so let's make sure that we get everybody here next Thursday and everybody is prepared to we will send out um, We'll have uh, Tucker send out the draft, whatever we have to everybody so that everybody sees it. Um, and then we'll um, be prepared to take testimony on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I can't even remember what we're doing next. Oh, election. Thank you.